Hello class. Welcome to another lecture for Introduction to Literature. Uh, the first text that we're starting with this semester uh, is Euripides' Bacchae. And so I want to do some initial introduction in this lecture to Greek tragedy. I'm not going to talk a ton about the text itself, although I'll read some of Ann Carson's introduction uh, here to the text. I'll give you a full lecture on Dionysus and Bacchae um, after the initial week. Uh, uh, so this is just a, a lecture to introduce you to the idea of ancient tragedy and to drama. So our class is going to be divided up into different sections. Um, we're going to start with drama with um, the Bacchae and then we'll read Macbeth. Uh, and then we go into short stories, poetry, and uh, fiction. And as we work through class this semester, we're going to be working closer towards the, the present. So we're starting with really old stuff and we're maneuvering towards uh, very recent stuff. Uh, so keep in mind, uh, hopefully you should have watched uh, my other introduction to literature and to the study of literature lecture, which was quite a bit um, uh, longer um, than I think I'll go, go through today. Uh, but make sure that you've watched that before you watch this video and then what you want to be paying attention for as you uh, uh, Listen to this lecture and maneuver through and I maneuver through the slides is the definitions that Aristotle gives for the terms of tragedy Because I'm gonna have you apply those terms in a discussion post as apply Aristotle's terms to um, uh, Euripides Bacchae, the tr translation by Ann Carson that we're reading for class. So that's our first kind of uh, homework assignment. Um, and it's a, so you want to click on discussion board. Um, once you're in Blackboard, if you click on discussion board uh, uh, and then you have to click, it'll open up other things like blogs and wikis, but you click on discussion board uh, from uh, that from the, that page and it'll open up a bunch of different discussions for you to click on. The first, um, just like when you did your introduction for class, right? Uh, you'll click on the discussion um, post for uh, week two, which is going to be asking you to apply Aristotle's terms to the text, and you'll do it there. And so if you have questions about that, you can email me um, or ask me during open office hours. Um, uh, uh, hopefully you have watched the syllabus overview so you understand um, uh, how, how class is working in terms of when we do discussion posts and things like that. So if you have questions about that, make sure that you've watched the other two videos before jumping right into this um, video on ancient tragedy. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about tragedy in general, but let's just I'd start with Ann Carson here, um, who's a really unique, um, she's a great poet in her own right. Um, she's a Canadian poet and um, she's also an expert in classics, right? And so she's translated lots and lots of ancient Greek stuff, but she has this real knack for translating it with, with very contemporary language. Um, as she's very creative as a translator, and that's why I wanted us to read um, her translation of the Bacchae. So I'm going to start with Ann Carson's words. Um, I'm not going to talk, like I said, a ton about the play, the Bacchae today, but I'm going to talk more just about ancient tragedy and Greek tragedy in, in general. So this is just from the introduction. If you have the book, you can read along with me here. Um, uh, the introduction says, it, its title is, I wish I were two dogs, then I could, could play with me. Um, so there's just a kind of weird line to begin with. And this is what she says. Dionysus is God of the beginning before the beginning. What makes beginning special? Think of your first sip of wine from a really good bottle. Opening page of a crime novel, start of an idea, tingle of falling in love. Beginnings have their own energy, ethics, tonality, color, greenish, bluish, purple, dewy, and cool, almost transparent as a ripe grape tone of alterity, things just about to change, already looking different, energy headlong and heedless and shot like a beam, ethics fantastically selfish. He is a young god, mythologically obscure, always just arriving at some new place to disrupt the status quo, wearing the start of a smile, 
the Greeks call him foreign and staged his incursion into polis after polis in stories like the one in Euripides Bacchae, a shocking play. Lecturing in Japan, Stephen Hawking was asked not to mention that the universe had be a beginning and so likely an end because it would affect the stock market. <laughs> uh, uh, speculation aside, we all need a prehistory. According to Freud, we do nothing but repeat it. Beginnings are special because most of them are fake. The new person you become with that first sip of wine was already there. Look at Pentheus twirling around in a dress, so pleased with his girl guys, he's almost in tears. Are we to believe this desire is new? Why was he keeping that dress in the back of the closet anyhow? Costume is flesh. Look at Dionysus, plucked prematurely from his doomed mother's womb and sewn up in the thigh of Zeus to be born again later. Life is a rehearsal for life. Here's a well-known secret about Dionysus. Despite all those legends of him as a new god imported to Greece from the east, his name is already on Linear B tablets that date to the 12th century BC. Previous is something a god can manage fairly well. Time, a fiction for him, but mortals less so. Look at those poor passionate women who worship this god, the Bacchae, destroyers of livestock and local people, and Pentheus the king. They had a prior existence once. The herdsman describes them lying at peace in the mountains, calm as buttons on a shirt. This is the world before men. The, then the posse arrives and violence begins. But what does this tell us? The shock of the new will prepare its own unveiling in old and brutal ways. Dionysus does not explain or regret anything. He is pleased if he can cause you to perform despite your plan, despite your politics, despite your neuroses, despite even your Dionysian theories of self, something quite previous, the desire before the desire, the lick of beginning to know you don't know. If life is a stage, that is some that is the show. Exit Dionysus. It's a really interesting introduction, and it's written in verse um, as well. So it's um, it's written as as poetry, but it's doing literary criticism as well. And those words, those charged words like desire, remember back to my initial lecture on desire and psychoanalysis. And um, notice how she uses Freud, right? Remember I, I said that uh, not in terms of medical usage, but um, uh, uh, his theories end up becoming important to us in literary theories in the history of its trajectory. And so Ann Carson's very recent translation and introduction of this book still draws on that, that information. Okay, so let's head into to these slides here. Uh, one thing we want to think about when we're thinking about Greek anything, oops, I went too far, is kind of the beginnings of uh, what we call literary criticism. And it begins with a discussion that's very ancient. It's a discussion that uh, um, Plato is, is plays a, a role in having, and Plato's main character that he kind of uses a lot was an actual person who was his teacher, but we only have access to him through Plato, and that's that's Socrates. So, so if you've ever heard about Socrates in ancient Greece, um, he is the teacher of Plato, and Plato kind of records his dialogues. But we can also we can only really think of Socrates as a character of Plato's because uh, we don't have anything actual um, uh, actual that Socrates himself wrote down. So it's all coming through Plato. So Plato lives from 427 to 327 BCE, so before current era. Um, and he writes a book um, that's very important in terms of, of uh, Western history, um, world history too, but especially Western history, uh, called Republic. And it's an idea of, of like what is the best way to form something like a public um, entity that, that's like a state. I mean, the word Republic means raise public or the public thing. Right. Um, and this idea of the polis, 
um, is a Greek, you probably learned some of this in, in high school. Uh, um, the idea of a polis uh, is, is the center of an activity, right? The center of civic activity. You can think of it kind of like a city or a capital, um, but we get words like police, right? We're, we're in the middle of a big discussion about, about police and violence in our country in the United States this year. Um, uh, we're in the middle of a COVID crisis for um, the, the COVID epidemic and uh, how we salvage our economy. These are all discussions that center around the idea, the current ideas of the polis. And so in Republic, Plato described what he thought would be the kind of ideal state. He didn't use the term state back then. It wasn't the same thing that we call a nation or a state today, um, but we can think of it a little bit in those terms. Uh, and so one of the books, it's book 10 actually of the Republic, um, uh, he starts talking about what is the place of art in the ideal Republic. And uh, he's a lover of art. He particularly loves um, uh, the Greek poet Homer, who wrote the um, w wrote down the oral um, epics of the Odyssey and the Iliad, which maybe you have read before in, in uh, high school or something. Uh, um, he loves Homer, but he doesn't know how to make art and, and Homer fit into his idea of the state. Um, and that's because he sees art as being um, essentially mimetic. And so like like mime, like like a pantomime or like, you know, like uh, a mimicry. Um, if you mimic someone else, that's what the term um, mime means. So he says that art is essentially mimetic and it's three times removed from reality, which only exists in the Greek form or in at least according to Plato. Um, uh, which only exists in ideal and unchanging forms. And so you can think about this um, in terms of my language lecture. And um, I was talking about dogs and how we have different sign systems. Um, so in Greek thought, there's a kind of ideal image of dog. And uh, um, the actual one actual dog is just one instance of a larger category, transcendental category of dog. Um, and, and we get like four legs and fur and ears and all, a tail, all of these sorts of characteristics. We could take the idea of a table too, right? So this is a classic way of talking about it. You have the idea of a table, right? It's like this flat thing. It's got maybe four legs and you put things on it. Uh, um, but there are lots of different forms that it can take. It could have three legs. It could have um, just one center post underneath. Uh, but we recognize the the table for what it is as an entity and so you have the idea the ideal image and the, this is why the greeks love math right because they believe that math is is reality is math reality is something transcendent reality is logic in this way like that two plus two is always going to equal four um and uh, so if we take the idea of a table that would be reality and then uh, an actual table like a living room table or something um that might that's one that or that that's a, that's one move away from reality so we're in category two art he says it mimics that so you have like a drawing of a table so the the table itself at least that there's some kind of use value you can you put things on it but a drawing of a table just mimics um the table in nature but the i the real table is the idea of the table and so art, because it mimics things, it's always moving us away from reality towards a kind of illusion. Uh, that's the way that Plato um, thinks about art. And he can't figure out a, w a way for it to be useful in our society. And this is important for us to think about in the 20th, 21st century as well. We're always worried about like funding for the arts. What is the place of art in, under COVID, right? You know, how many of you listen to a lot of music or watch a lot of Netflix um, while you're in social isolation? Um, was your social isolation part of your reason for taking this class, for example? That, that might be something to think about as well. So if I go back to the slide here, um, art is essentially mimetic and three times removed from reality, which only exists in ideal and unchanging forms. The only art that can or ought to be allowed in 
the ideal society consists of hymns praising the Republic or the state or the polis. So that's what Socrates slash Plato says in the Republic. And it's just like, you can just think about it like patriotic music or like parade music. Like what if, what if the only art we were able to, or music we were able to listen to is just like, like John Philip Sousa, like parade marches and, um, you know, oh, like, oh, beautiful for spacious skies, um, songs about America. That's all we could listen to. That's all we could watch or shows that are praising the state. Um, art um, or the term that they use in the Greek term is poiesis and we get the word poetry from this but the in greek um the in ancient greek the word poiesis is the is the verb to make so when we're talking about poetry or poetics it's the making of something we could talk about the poetics of architecture the poetics of dance right uh um or poetry itself so um socrates knows that people are not gonna be happy with his definition of, of like the best, the art that's going to be um, uh, in the ideal state or the Republic. Um, and so he puts this question to future critics and he says, like, he says, I would love, I really would love to have Homer and the Iliad. I, I love that art, but like what it does is it riles people's emotions up. It like gets them, uh, uh, um, acting in irrational ways and it makes heart people harder to control and if people aren't sort of really keeping their emotions under control we're not going to have a good stable society um, so he says but I, I know I, I love this stuff I just can't think of a way of a reason for it to exist in the ideal state and so he says if anyone can make a better argument um, he's willing to hear it because he admires Homer above all poets, um, but he gets emotion. But Homer gets emotions riled up and risks producing poor judgment among citizens. <clears throat> Poetry he sees as divine possession or inspiration or Bacchic frenzy, and Bacchus as another name for Dionysus. So, if you like the Bacchae. Um, are the women who are the followers of the god Dionysus. And as we will see in the tragedy, they go crazy. They, they, they wreak havoc on the polis and the sphere and King Pentheus, right? So there's this play that's going to be dealing with that tension between the state and the thing that disrupts the state. And I really want you to think about it in terms of disruptions to the state right now the recent Black Lives Matter protests, especially thinking about crowds and violence and crowds and protest and how do you make people in power hear you, um, especially if you have a traditionally oppressed voice. How is that? How does that happen? Um, so uh, this literature is very old, but it will hopefully be speaking to very contemporary times as well. Um, uh, um, there's a notion of the sublime. I'm not going to go too much into it in this particular lecture, um, but if you want to think about art and poetry or divine possession, a good place to start is um, a, a first century current era um, writer named Longinus um, who has an essay on the sublime. Or, and, and he says that what's interesting in that essay is that he says, even though Plato makes these accusations against art, what is Plato doing? He's making these dialogues that are art. Like, so how can you really make an accusation against art when you're using art to make the form of your dramatic dialogue for your philosophy? So that's just interesting thing to think about there. Okay, so so um, here, here we have it. At the beginning of, of a Western literary criticism, well, there's this question like, what is art and what we can think about literature? What is literature's function in, in life? Why do we have it? Why do people get paid to teach it? All of those questions. Um, what kinds of public funding should we give to it? Uh, uh, um, should artists or writers be able to make a living on the, the novels and, and writing that they produce? Should they get paid? Um, uh, how should we treat our poets? Uh, so if we go on here, um, we think about tragedy. So tragedy, Greek tragedy, is a specific form of writing or drama that develops. Um, so the word drama in Greek just means action. So if you have ever, ever seen a film or a movie like where they have the little clipboard for the sound clipping, they say action. Uh, 
uh, that's like the starting of the dramatic action. Um, and tragedy deals in these horrible situations that happen. This is kind of what Socrates is talking about. Like, why do we get so fascinated and get our emotions riled up in these awful things that happen to these characters on stage? Why are we intrigued by, uh, by, by, by watching people suffer? Uh, classical tragedy tended to focus on heroes of elevated rank. And the reason for that is that if you start with a character who's like elevated up high, we, there's a place for them to fall socially. And tragedy tells the story of a character's fall um, from a great height. And so you're dealing necessarily um, in ancient forms of tragedy with kings and princes and queens and royalty, things like that. And even uh, when we get to Shakespeare, he'll still be dealing with that. As we move towards modernity, that shifts. So be, a, be attentive to that. Um, if we look at the word history of tragedy, the etymology, that's a fancy name for the, the history of a word, um, we see it showing up in English in the late 1400, for, sorry, 14th century, so the late 1300s, as a play or a serious literary work with an unhappy ending. So that's one, one way it kind of shifts. Um, in Greek times, it really is about Greek, what we might call Greek religion. Um, and so the gods and the ways that the gods are showing up is, is this is pre-Christianity, right? And and so uh, it's got a really different place in Greek culture than it than it shows up in fourteenth uh, uh, century Europe. Uh, but so it takes on this idea from old French of tragedy of uh, a play with an with an unhappy ending, but it comes from the Latin word tra um, tragedia or a tragedy from the Greek tragodia, which is a dramatic poem or play in formal language and having an unhappy resolution, um, apparently a goat song. So the word, the root here um, is tragos or go goat or buck um, and then song. Um, and I'll have more to say about that in my specific Dionysus lecture, but um, we'll think about goats and particularly goat sacrifices. Um, uh, uh, which are a part of, of ancient um, uh, ceremonial culture. And so we know that in performances of Greek tragedies, they took on a kind of religious character. Um, they're very serious material and that um, they might have accompanied some sort of goat sacrifice. And so the idea of what, a, of what sacrifice is is gonna be really important and I'll have a whole lecture on it. Um, they say here the connection may, might be um, via satiric drama, which um, uh, uh, from which tra tragedy later developed in which actors or singers were dressed in goat skins to represent satyrs. Um, so satyrs are kind of mythological half person, half goat figures. Um, and so the early, what we think is that the early actors, the early people on stage were dressing up and they used goat masks or goat skins as they were doing um, uh, their stuff. So the, the goat is important here. Um, later on, it just becomes kind of any unhappy event. So Aristotle is a student of Plato and, what, and he comes up with a defense of art against what Plato says. So remember Plato says, what is the place of art in the ideal Republic? In public society, why do we have art? It gets people riled up, gets their emotions going. Uh, it makes things unrest, unrest likely to happen. Um, he says, I like Homer, but I don't know how to fit him into the ideal society. So we should just have songs that praise the nation. <laughs> um, uh, Aristotle says, um, well, if we look at poetry, um, we want to break poetry down into different kinds of elements. So one way we can talk about it is drama, which we're focusing on in our class at the beginning. And drama can be broken down into tragedy and comedy. Tragedy is when something bad happens, everybody's unhappy at the end. Comedy is when people are all happy at the end. Maybe everybody gets married, something like that. Um, then there's epic forms, and we're not going to be reading epic in this class, but like uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, these big long books, they're epics. And so epics generally deal with a kind of third person narrator, and they tell a really long story over several years, like 10 years of the Trojan War, for example. 
Um, so you have drama, you have epic poetry, and you have lyric poetry. And the word lyric poetry comes from a, a Greek instrument. It's kind of a guitarish looking instrument called the lyre. And in lyric poetry, this is where we get kind of love songs. And in lyric poetry, you get the first person I. So think about hip hop songs, for example. Like in hip hop, even today, um, it's very I focused language, right? Um, and and or even love songs, it's always about a personal person's situation speaking to um, uh, their beloved. Um, and so when we talk about song lyrics today, um, there's that kind of first person element going on, which is different than the epic element, unless you're dealing with a big concept for album or something like that. Uh, Aristotle agrees that art is mimetic, that it imitates nature. Um, so its representation um, is natural to human learning, though. He says that we as humans and babies, like we learn by mimicking our parents for how to talk. So like imitation is, or mimicking is not necessarily a bad thing for him. Um, and he says that it's the chief purpose of all composition is actually that we're mimicking something in nature. He says poetry has to be allowed in our society because tragedy allows audiences to purge excessive emotion. So yeah, when we look at really nasty things happen to people on, on stage, um, it might get our emotions riled up as we identify with characters on stage. But what happens to us collectively, especially if we all go to the Greek theater and we watch a play together and we get our emotions raised is that it purges us of negative emotions um, we might learn through pity and terror of, from what happens to the characters on stage ways to act so we don't necessarily do some of the bad things <laughs> that some of the characters do on stage so um, those are some of Aristotle's defenses for why we should have art and his term is catharsis or purification and so that think about to the idea of sacrifice there right that there's an element of purification going on in sacrifice and so uh, if greek tragedy and greek drama was part of uh, uh some kind of greek religious kind of ceremony uh people going to the theater um was part of this kind of sacrificial element um and uh, aristotle says that they were purifying themselves um, so audience members, he says, live vicariously through the dramatic players on stage, and they learn what they ought not to do. He says tragedy is a form of drama as opposed to comedy. So I already kind of mentioned this. Tragedy, according to um, Pelagia Gulamari, who's a recent uh, literary critic uh, um, uh, who, who's written a good history of, of literary criticism from Plato to present, um, Gulamari says, tragedy is a representation of a serious, complete action which has a magnitude, an embellished speech. Um, so, you know, just like somebody slipping on a banana or like, you know, like falling, like like taking a, a spill on a bike or something, you know, that we might laugh or we might be like, oh, are you okay? But like, it's not grand enough to be a tragedy. Um, so we need something that accomplishes by means of pity and terror the catharsis of such emotions. And that's really what, I mean, it's Gulamari, but she is um, uh, really citing and talking about Aristotle here. Um, the emphasis is on a unity of action, a complete action of a play. So everything going into the play, no matter how ridiculous the characters might seem to us from modern times, everything is supposed to be moving towards this action that happens, which is going to be some sort of uh, downfall of a main character, a tragic situation. Um, uh, later on, critics developed um, three unities, time, action, and place. Um, uh, so that's, some, that's something you might want to think about, um, especially as we get to Shakespeare. Um, these are the elements of tragedy. Th this page is really important for your homework because I, as you read Euripides' Bacchae, I want you to apply these to the Bacchae. I'm going to talk about it today in terms of Oedipus, which we're not reading for class. And so the task here is to try and see, as you read Ann Carson's translation, where these ideas show up. So the first word is mythos or muthos in Greek. And that's the complete action, the beginning, middle, and the end of the piece. So what happens in the tragedy itself? Uh, what what structures the, the action of this little book that we're going to read? Um, 
it should have plot what happens it should have characters who are the main people involved diction is word choice reasoning so um uh why do people make the actions that they have spectacle so what do we see going on from the characters on stage and song um and and you'll see that there's like a chorus and uh, as one of the characters and the chorus in greek plays is you can think about it like song choruses like the song chorus gives or greek, the, the chorus in a greek play gives the perspective of the community so it will be like a group of people walking around um, or even if it was just one actor out acting as the chorus what that chorus is is the collection of public voices around an issue um, and so that that element of song um, uh, is in there as well. Um, another term that Aristotle uses is peripatia, and that means a reversal, a change of intended effect, a shift in fortune of a lofty character. So you want to look for a lofty character in Bacchae whose fortunes completely change or are reversed. Um, who is that in the Bacchae? Um, as you go to do your discussion post on this. Hamartia, which sometimes gets tra translated as tragic flaw, but it's not necessarily a flaw. It does mean falling short in archery, but really um, a better way of thinking about it is, is a moral blindness. It's not necessarily that you have a flaw in and of yourself. It's that you just don't know. You can't see enough um, uh, of the universal order to act a certain way. So Oedipus, if we take the example of, of this story, in, in the Oedipus tragedy by Sophocles, Oedipus is this character who is fated since before he's even born that he's going to grow up and he's going to murder his father and marry his mother. So there's a there's a, 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 a this destiny that he has from the outset. And so what happens is when he's born, his parents learn of this destiny and they send him off to a foreign land so that he will grow up not even knowing who they are. And they're just like, we got to get rid of him. Um, and then uh, as Oedipus grows up, he learns about his own fate and his destiny. And so, but he's grown up in a foreign land and he's like, he's like, well, I don't want to kill my father and marry my mother if I'm fated to do that. So I'm going to run as far away from here as possible. So where does he run? He ends up actually kind of like making his way back to where he was initially born, runs into his uh, father, um, the king who is the king of Thebes, uh, on the road ends up beginning in a fight with this guy and ends up killing him uh and he doesn't know he's his father if, when when it happens then later he goes on and, and there's like a plague going on and and uh he saves the day um by solving the riddle of the sphinx and you can read the play to figure out um, how that goes and through that he he becomes the king and by becoming the the king he marries the the existing queen um, who he has no idea is, is his mother, um, and then finds out later on that um, he tried as hard as he could to escape his fate, but he couldn't do it. And so he, then he finds out he's it's already happened. Like he's already married his mother. Um, uh, he's already killed his father, and no matter what he tried to do. So it wasn't necessarily a fault. It wasn't like, like there, there was much he could do. And so people have to part of the tragedy is is looking at like man like that was a really crappy thing that lot that you were dealt with in life um uh even the gods pitied um oedipus um now anagnoresis is the next term here is that moment of recognition moving from ignorance to knowledge um which is also called metanoia which is above knowing like it's like oh now i see what really happened like and and once Oedipus realizes, like it's like he only recognizes after the fact, right? That he um, that fate has been accomplished, no matter how he tried to escape his own fate. Um, so tragedy should not should be complex, and it shouldn't be um, just simple. That's another element. So all of those characteristics, you want to take these definitions and apply them to this text. Um, over the, the first week here of class that you are reading. I'm going to go on with Greek tragedy. So I already kind of said this. Um, we're not reading an epic in this class. We don't have time this summer. 
um, but an epic is is a narrative style that uses the same verse and meter throughout um, and and it has no specific time span um, while tragedy is normally within a pretty condensed time period sometimes even just 24 hours or a little bit over um, and uh, um, lyric in Greek lyrics or lyric poetry is written in the dialects of ancient Greece, Greek. Um, it was primarily associated with um, the early 7th to 5th centuries BC um, and sometimes called at the lyric age of ancient Greece. Um, it continued to be written into later um, periods as well. But like I said a few minutes ago, lyrics have that lyrical eye. And you'll come back to that when we get to the poetry section in a few weeks in class, when we look at more specific lyric poetry. Um, so here are some other just famous Greek tragedians um, or playwriters. Um, Aeschylus um, wrote a number of plays, especially the Oresteia is an important one. A lot of Greek mythology shows up in these plays. Um, and so he's living, um, he's a little bit earlier than um, Euripides who we're, we're reading. Um, he lives from uh, about 525 to about 455. Um, and then um, Sophocles we have who wrote, writes down the Oedipus story. Um, Oedip there are other versions that these characters show up in different people's plays. But everybody in a Greek audience would be going to the play and they'd already, they'd already know the story of Oedipus. Right, they'd already know what happens, but the way that these um, tragedians or these playwriters dealt with the Oedipus story—that's what they're looking for, right? So uh, Sophocles um, assumed that his audience knew the basic Oedipus storyline, um, and so what's important is the way that the story is woven into the text. He also wrote Electra. Um, which parallels Aeschylus's libar libation bearers, some of the same characters. Um, and then, um, so these are some themes that show up in Oedipus um, uh, that are also sort of beyond uh, Aristotle's terms. So blindness. So what actually what Oedipus does when he finds out that he's married his mother and killed his father is he puts his own eyes out. He blinds himself. But that's ironic because he was blind to his fate the whole time before um so it creates this doubled image so that the the oedipus who has who, who can see clearly is actually the oedipus who has um uh um poked out his own eyes um and then fate or destiny and then this term apophasis which i'll give you a definition for here in a minute um Euripides, who we're reading, um, is the playwright for the Bacchae, although we're reading it in Ann Carson's very updated translation. Uh, and so the Bacchae is written towards the end of his life. He's a very celebrated playwright, wrote over 90 plays, but we don't have that many of them. That have, like They just haven't all made it down through history. Um, but we know that um, the Bacchae was performed towards the end of his life. So we're reading an uh, uh, an old man's sort of take on society and its situation. And so that's really, really interesting that he chose to deal with Dionysus um, and, and um, the Bacchae, the followers of Dionysus in this last place. So you, you want to be thinking about as you read this, like what is Euripides, how, how is he commenting on society, right? How is he commenting on those ideas, even though they're a little bit later, of like what is art's place in society? Even you could think about that. Um, very late in his life, uh, if we take irony, this is a, just a kind of a textbook or Encyclopedia Britannica's definition of dramatic irony. So this, this is a term you might use in your, um, reading responses or in your discussion posts as we go on throughout the semester. Uh, the, the textbook definition of dramatic irony is a literary device by which the audience or the reader's understanding of events or individuals in a work surpasses that of its characters. And so just think back, like everybody going in a Greek audience to see Oedipus the play knows, like, or Oedipus the king, um, knows what's going to happen to Oedipus. But Oedipus the, on stage, the character doesn't know what's going to happen to him. And so it creates irony. So you need to have that kind of doubleness that, um, if you think back even to my lectures on identity and um, subject-object ob relationships, you, there's some thought work you can do there. 
Uh, they say dramatic irony is a form of irony that is expressed through a, a work structure. An audience's awareness of the situation in which a work's characters exist differ, uh, differs substantially from that of the characters, and the words and actions of characters therefore take on a different or often contradictory meaning. Like a character might say something, but it has a double meaning to the audience. Um, it's often associated with theater, but it can be found in other works of literature and performing arts as well. Apophasis, I said I would come back to this term. Um, and so the the term um, actually means away, apo, means sort of like the, to move away from something and to say no. Uh, it's a rhetorical device wherein the speaker or the writer brings up a subject either by denying it or denying that it should be brought up. It's very close. Um, it's, 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 it's a rhetorical relative of irony. Um, and there are other terms for it. You don't need to remember these terms, but paralipsis um, uh, or occupatio, that's a Latin term. Uh, and uh, so apophasis is like, you know, you can think of it like if you called, uh, uh, like, and here's an example. You see, you called the White House and, <laughs> and you got through and you said, I want to talk to the president. And the person on the other line said, the president is on vacation. Um, which is kind of an answer, but it doesn't say where the president is, right? Um, it, it, it gives you an answer, but the answer is in negation. Um, and so we want to look at language that says something, but actually hides something at the same time. That's what apophasis is. And so there's uh, the iron, ironic language that shows up in tragedy or that doubled speak type of language. Um, uh, apophasis is a good term to be thinking of as well um okay and so this pushes beyond our first weeks in class but we're going to go from ancient tragedy with euripides bacchae to a more modern tragedy with shakespeare's macbeth and then with the later books that we read the no more current novels um later on in class so just as we're thinking about tragedy initially um this week uh think about um modern versus ancient so uh here's another quote from Gulamari, uh, the multi-perspectivism of liberal modern tragedy is intensified into epistemological or the study of knowledge, like how we know things, is intensified into the epistemological uncertainty and breakdown of self-perception and disrecognition, while the multiplicity of the self is intensified into roles, performances of the self, in the absence of the unifying rational core self assumed by liberalism or play. So Greek, Greek tragedy focuses on that high character that's way up, the king, the noble person. But as we get to more and more modern tragedy, it gets to be focused on just the normal individual self. And that's what we mean by liberalism, right? We live, and by liberal, I don't mean Democrat versus Republican. Liberalism is our economic structure and it focuses on individuals with rights. And so tragedy in the modern era ends up focusing more and more on just the common individual rather than a king or a queen, even though in Shakespeare we'll still see it happening with, with kings, with Macbeth. Um, so if I go back here where I stopped here, instead of the liberal modern conflict between society and an individual, the self is now in a moral vacuum and lacks deep interiority so that it is no longer possible to distinguish between resistance and compromise. And so the more, when we get into like more recent literature, there's a lot more moral ambiguity. Um, we don't know who's in charge. The king isn't necessarily a good person or the pol politicians who are in charge are not necessarily good people. Um, so we don't, we can't just put somebody high up and elevated. We can't assume that somebody, just because they have a high status in society, that they're noble or that they're a good person in modern situations. And so that will change the ways that we think about tragedy. Because like, it might be like a really rich person who's a jerk face and like something bad happens to them. It's, it's not tragedy. It's like, that might be a form of justice. Um, so in contrast, um, Aristotle's tragic theory asserts the soul of tragedy is not the interiority of a character. And this is important, but the externality of action. It's not that Oedipus makes this internal decision, like a bad, a bad decision at some point, and he can't, and, and, and he could have gotten away, 
outside of his fate, right? That he could have escaped his fate in some way if he just would have made another choice. So you want to resist that as a reader. It's not a matter of, of looking at like, like, oh, when does the main character, when could they have made that a better choice? Um, <coughs> that kind of goes against what the point of tragedy is. The point of tragedy is to say that fate is in some ways inescapable, especially for ancient tragedy. It'll be a little bit different for Macbeth um, when we get there. So Aristotle says that tra um, it's not about interiority, it's about the externality of action itself. Uh, the best tragedies move beyond suffering and move towards peripatia or anagnoresis. And I see that my, my face is frozen again here, so I'm going to stop this and start a new video, so bear with me. And I'll, plug, I'll, I'll edit it all into one single video again. I'll help you right back. Uh, <clears throat> on my computer, I've, I've been making so many videos under COVID, and the computer's working really hard. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so uh, we want to be thinking about that distinction between modern tragedy and, and Greek tragedy. Um, and external for versus internal is a really good way of thinking about it. The more, as we get into modern literature, it becomes like much more psychological, much more about the interior of a self or a person, but the earlier stuff is much more about external actions. Um, and so you want to really focus on peripatia, that reversal of fortune, and the moment of recognition when the, uh, the character who has gone through that reversal uh, makes that that moment of recognition uh, and so if we go, keep going here I'm just about done with my slides here um, <clears throat> again we're, we're the first week here we're just going to be on in the ancient world but we're moving really quickly towards modernity um, so once we're at Shakespeare we're dealing with modernism uh, remember it's not the latest iPhone app, day, uh, app update or something like that um, modernism that we're talking about like about late 1500s around the year 1600 to the present um, and so there are different definitions that scholars will give for modernism um, uh, so here a couple here philosophical and linguistic definitions of modern generally refer to 15th and 16th centuries um, thus Shakespearean English is modern English not middle or old English or Anglo-Saxon uh, in uh, Hamlet, for example, one of Shakespeare's plays, you can think about, there's a famous line where Hamlet says, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. And what, why I pull that line is because it's like, it's all about the inside, the interior crisis of Hamlet's head. That signals that we're in modernity, as opposed to like ancient heroes and kings and tragedies. <clears throat> or uh, the philosopher Rene Descartes writes in 15, or sorry, 1641, um, the um, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, if I, you've ever heard those famous lines, um, skeptical philosophy looks back and it says, how do I exist? The only way that I know that I exist, it's not because like, like I, God made me or something like that. It's like, I know that I exist because I can think about myself as a thinking person. Right, and and you can hear some of that echo in Lacan's language if you think back to my Lacan lecture um, uh, about I think where I do about myself where I do not think to think all about this fascination with identity and um, we're very consumed with issues of identity in our contemporary lives. Um, high or literary modernism is a movement that begins in the late nineteenth uh, century. So if you sometimes talk about like um, uh, literature, modernist literature, um, uh, sometimes people are referring to a movement in Germany and England around the late 1800s, early 1900s. And we get pe people like uh, T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound, James Joyce. We'll read some of these people in the short stories and poetry sections or Virginia Woolf. Uh, um, so that's a particular little period of literature. Um, uh, some more th characteristics of modern versus ancient is that with modernity we see a shift away from the nobly born protagonist, the king or the prince that falls. Um, and how do we want to focus on how does a writer represent a fall or what becomes tragic if there's no place to fall from? Uh, 
Uh, some of you would might have read um, Death of a Salesman in high school, right? And the character's name is Larry Lo or sorry Willie Lowman. Um, low man, right? He's like not. He's kind of a loser. And so, how do you make an interesting play about somebody who's kind of a loser? Or for those of you who read people like like more contemporary novels like Charles Bukowski, like Ham on Rye, um, or if you've seen or read the book, um, uh, the Nick Hornby book, High Fidelity, for example, it's like the characters are jerks. They're anti-heroes, we might call them, but they're, they're also just like, like, like you we wouldn't want to be like them. And it's like, why, why do we, why are we interested in these, these kind of um, uh, uh, real, um, kind of nasty characters, for example. So, um, again, it's not literature isn't always about liking or identifying with characters. Sometimes we're not supposed to identify with them. So, if you don't identify with a character, that's not enough of a reason to say, like, well, I don't like that play or that book because I just don't identify with anybody. It's like it might <laughs> not supposed to be that way. I mean, I mean, sorry, it might it may have been written to be that way, right? Um, how in modernity is something to think about. How do we deal with catharsis? Um, how do we purify? Is catharsis something that we need in current society? Um, purging things. I, I was thinking about this with the Black Lives Matter protests, which are really important just in terms of Black Lives Matter, right? In terms of the justice around the movement for black lives uh, and the unrest that, that, that blows up at different times, whether it's Michael Brown um, uh, or, or earlier um, tragedies that have happened, happened to to um, uh, young black men, especially um, uh, um, all those not always men, right? Uh, uh, but so we there are these moments of un unrest that sort of blow up, but also we've been under lockdown in the United States too. So uh, um, the recent uh, a, a police violence has has like kind of doubled in terms of intensity. Uh, are people letting loose um, rage um, among other things too, right? And does that kind of release of energy um, uh, that some pro protesters um, uh, uh, are releasing does it get in the way, and sometimes sometimes in the way of what the kind of leaders of the movement. Uh, for black lives are trying to say, or what African American people are trying to say about the race problem, does it get obscured by by folks who are trying to purge other emotions because they've been so locked up under COVID nineteen um, social distancing or something like that? That's a really interesting contemporary problem that we can maybe be thinking of in the background. Um, so, how do we think about catharsis in modernity? How do we think about identification or mimesis? Um, Hamlet is a prince in Shakespeare, like Macbeth is a king in Shakespeare that we'll read. There, Hamlet is nobly born, but he's incapable of being a hero. So there's this shift away from the hero in modernity. Um, uh, and uh, the German philosopher Hegel um, has an, an enlightenment a notion of master-slave dialectic. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I might in future lectures when we get into modernity. Um, so the tragedy, um, as we maneuver in towards towards the future, we, it shifts from being in plays and from drama, and it maneuvers into the novel. So when we get to Celia Satterstrom's uh, slab to potted meat, um, and uh, to the transmigration of bodies, the last three books that we'll deal with in the semester, um, we'll be looking for this theme of tragedy showing up in the novel as well, and not in plays. So. I chose the theme of tragedy for this summer because we've been dealing with quite a bit of tragedy in our society um, with uh, um, the outbreak of epidemics, with the social unrest of um, an institutional racism um, and the way that that is playing out in our country and affecting all of us as citizens uh, in, in our country. These are things that I want to be thinking about this summer, um, even though we won't get to explicit the the later novels, as you'll see in class, deal with themes of, uh, of race very explicitly, much more so than these first two plays that we're, um, that we're reading. Um, and then one last quote here by um, Pelagia um, 
Gulamari, um, she says, uh, against neoclassical dogma, um, which was that the tragedy concerns itself with the fate of the socially prominent the kings, princes, queens, royalty, noble people. The novel as a genre is committed in particular to serious treatment of common people. And this is something that Eric Auerbach, who's a great literary theorist, wrote in a big, big famous book from the 1950s called Mimesis. So as we maneuver towards modernity, it becomes more focused on individual selves, on interiority of moral dilemmas within a self or psychological dramas. Um, and so it changes the nature of tragedy. And that's kind of the arc of where we're going to go throughout the, the semester this summer. Um, if you have questions on this stuff, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, otherwise, this take this lecture and my discussion here, the terms using Aristotle's elements of tragedy from this lecture in PowerPoint, you want to apply them to your reading of the Bacchae. There are due dates listed on Blackboard for uh, um, when you need to have your discussion post posted. Um, and I set it up so that you have to come up with your own answers before you can see and respond to um, peers as well. So just pay attention, leave yourself time. Um, to not only to post your own stuff, but to respond to a couple of your peers, because that's part of our assignments as well. Uh, yeah, reach out with questions and um, uh, uh, happy reading for the Bacchae. Um, uh, uh, jump right in, and I can't wait to see um, how you guys apply Aristotle's um, terms to uh, this, this Euripides play. Thanks, and um, we'll talk to you soon.